We're going to look in the book of Joshua, and uh, you know the story. I hope you know the story. The children of Israel had wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, and now Moses was dead, and Joshua, his servant, had taken over, and uh, they were going to cross over the Jordan River, and the first city that they were going to come to was the city of Jericho. Later on, our Lord Jesus Christ was going to visit that same place. There's actually been three Jerichos, the Jericho in Moses' day, the Jericho in Jesus' day, and the Jericho today. We were in Jericho. When you go to Jerusalem, to Jericho, it's like going from New Jersey to Florida because of the elevation. And we went there to Jericho, and they, they tried to feed us something, and they said it was chicken. Vic smiling. It wasn't chicken. I don't know what it was, but I didn't eat it. So my memories of Jericho, you know. Uh, anyway, so the children of Israel were going to march around the city of Jericho for six days, once every day. And then the seventh time around, they, they were going to go seven times, total of 13 times. And the walls came down flat. And there's one lady mentioned, one person mentioned out about that city, and her name is Rahab. And uh, so we're going to kind of center on Rahab tonight. And uh, it's really not centered on Rahab, it's really centered on the Lord. But we're going to talk about Rahab. In Joshua chapter 2, Joshua the son of Nun sent out two men to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, even Jericho. And they went and came into a harlot's house named Rahab, and they lodged there. Now the Bible says, even a child is known by his doings. And we need to have a good testimony. We have a good, need to have a good reputation because your reputation sticks with you. And here's this woman, and her name is Rahab. And the Bible says that she is a harlot. And uh, we're going to pick it up in verse number 8. And before they were laid down, two spies came in to spy out the land. And they went to her house, and she's going to hide them. And she came up unto them on the roof. She had them hidden up on the roof. They were laying under piles of flax so nobody could find them. And she said unto the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land. So notice here, the Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, the God of the Israelites. And, that you're t and let me just say this, that land still is Israel's land. There's, no, there's all kind of fighting and disputing and all about, you know, the land and the occupied territory and the West, all that business. Listen, God gave it to them, it's theirs. God's not an Indian giver. He don't take it back. So she said, I know the Lord God hath given you land, and your terror has fallen upon us, and all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard how the Lord, and that, again, she's talking about the Lord, dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did under the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of Jordan, uh, Sion and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. Notice, for the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. This woman believed in Jehovah God. She, she had more belief than a lot of people do today, I can tell you that. Now therefore I pray you, swear unto me by the Lord since I've showed you kindness, that you will show also kindness unto my father's house and give me a true token. And that you will save alive my father and my mother and my brethren and my sisters and all that they have and deliver our lives from death. And the men answered her, our lives for yours. If you utter not this our business, it shall be when the Lord hath given us the land that we will deal kindly and truly with thee. Then she let them down by a cord through the window. For her house was upon the town wall, and she dwelt 
upon the wall. Look at verse 17. And the men said unto her, We will be blameless of this thy oath, which thou hast made us swear. Behold, when we come into the land, thou shalt bind this line of scarlet thread in the window, which thou did let us down by. And thou shalt bring thy father and thy mother and thy brethren and all thy father's household home unto thee. Look at verse 21. And she said, according to your word, so be it. And she sent them away and they departed and she bound the scarlet line in the window. Turn with me over to Joshua chapter number six. And I'm going to read one verse, verse 25. And Joshua saved Rahab the harlot alive and her father's household and all that she had. And she dwelled in Israel even unto this day because she hid the messengers which Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. Father, I thank you again for the word of God. Lord, we thank you for every word of God. And Lord, I pray that you bless the message tonight. Lord, we've been blessed today. Lord, we've heard great messages. We've had great singing. And Lord, you've given us safety today and saved somebody today. And Lord, we just thank you for how good you are. Lord, I pray again tonight that you'll bless us. Lord, I pray you bless your word. And I pray this message would just be in our hearts. And Lord, that you'd move us and touch us. And we ask you this in Jesus' name. Amen. So <clears throat> here's this story. The children of Israel are going to march around the wall and they're going to blow the trumpets. The ark's going to go around and they're going to shout and the wall's going to fall down. But there's this one house with this scarlet thread and this is where Rahab is and her family. They're inside there and she's going to be spared. Now we know Joshua and his men are the ones that spare her, but we know it's actually God behind the scenes that's doing this. So we want to look at some things just very quickly tonight about uh, Rahab and, and some things about this story. Number one, I want to say this woman was a sinner. I mean, there's no doubt about that. Rahab the harlot. In the Ten Commandments, it says this, one of them, I believe it's the seventh one, Exodus 20, 14, thou shalt not commit adultery. I mean, that's a clear command. There's, there's no gray area there. So she has broken the law of God and she's a sinner. But let me say this, so are you. And let me say this, so am I. The Bible says over in Romans 3.10, all have sinned come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. You don't have to break every law to be a lawbreaker. You only had to break one. And we've all broken at least one and if we've broken one, we're guilty of all. Hold your finger here and go over to the book of James. And in James chapter number 2, and I'll read verse 10. Whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point is guilty of all. Now, you don't have to break every law in the book to be a criminal. You only had to break one. And you don't have to break every law of God to be a sinner. You only had to break one. And we've all broken at least one. And we can look down and say, well, I didn't do that one. I wasn't as bad as that. There's no good sin. I remember in the Agco building going back probably 20 years ago, there was a man I prayed for for years and years and I like to think he got saved, but I really don't have much hope about it. But I remember I was witnessing to him and he said this, he said, I'm a sinner, but I'm not a bad sinner. Well, can I tell you something? There's no good sinners and there's no good sin. We look at sin like big sin, little sin, bad sin, not so bad. God looks at sin, it's all sin to God. It's all the same. So the Bible says if we offend in one point, we're guilty of it all. For he that said, do not commit adultery, which we've just covered, said also, do not kill. Now if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. Now, this woman, Rahab, 
is a picture of a perfect sinner. And we could say she represents every sinner because every man that's ever lived outside Lord Jesus Christ is a sinner. So here's this woman, she's a sinner. But say, let me say secondly, she was saved. She was saved physically. She didn't perish with the rest of the people, but she's also saved spiritually. She's as saved as Joshua saved. Think about it. Now, here's the amazing thing. Out of all the people in Jericho, why her? I mean, Rahab, what? The harlot. Why, why her? To me, she would be like the most unlikely one that God was going to spare. I mean, if, if I was God, I'd try to pick the most moral person, I'd, I'd, uh, the nicest person, the best person, the, the, the one with the most character. I'd try to pick somebody that seemed like, you know, they, they deserved it. They deserved it. Well, this woman, to me, would be the last person that you would pick. Why did God pick her? I was thinking about this. It could be, and I believe this is at least part of it, for God to show us how great his grace is. Let me ask you this question. We say, why her? Let me ask you this question. Why you? Why are you saved? Do you, do you, do you think you deserve it more than other people? There's nobody, listen, there's no, not one person in this room, not one person in this world deserves to be saved. Because grace, we're saved by grace, and grace is getting what you don't deserve. People that think they're good enough to be saved don't get it. You don't, you don't get saved by works, you get saved by grace. By grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourselves, a gift of God, not of works, lest anybody should boast, lest anyone should boast. Titus 2.11, the grace of God to bring in salvation hath appeared to all men. Teaching us denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. That's what grace teaches. Grace is undeserved favor. Let me say this. This shows that God can save anybody. God can save anybody. From the guttermost to the othermost. We have this idea, you know, we're a little better than most, and we don't smoke, and we don't chew, and we don't go with the girls that do. And I picked that up when I was a kid. But you, you listen, you know better than anybody else. Every, every person in this room that broke one letter of law is a sinner. And, and we're all at the same, same level. There's not big sinner, little sinner. The good sinner and bad sinner, all of sin come short of glory of God. Let me say this. I think one of the reasons God saved her was to show that no sin is too great for God to forgive. I think it's an encouragement to people. No sin, listen, is too big a sin, too bad a sin, too great a sin that God won't forgive it. God will forgive any sin. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Think about it. Paul said this. He said, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I'm chief. He wasn't just talking. He wasn't just blowing smoke around. Paul knew he was a sinner. Paul knew what he was. Paul knew what he had done. And yet he knew God forgave him anyway. David, we, we think about David. I mean, of all the people for God to call a man into God's own heart, David commits adultery with another man's wife. And when you look at Uriah, Uriah was one of David's mighty men. I mean, you talk about loyalty, you talk about faithful. Uriah was, was, had so much character, it's amazing. And then David has him killed. So here's David, a man that commits adultery, a man that murders. And you say, well, I never did any of those things. Well, the Bible says we're guilty of all those things. We're guilty, we're sinners. 
How about Peter? Brother Mike mentioned this morning about Peter. How Peter denied the Lord three times. And God still forgave him. So it doesn't make any difference what the sin is. God will forgive your sin if you confess it and forsake it to God. So we see this woman, she was a sinner, but we see also she was saved. You say, well, show me where she's saved. All right, look over in Hebrews 11. There's two things that I'm going to point out tonight that amaze me, and this is one of them. In Hebrews chapter number 11, and I'd like you to turn over there if you just would turn. But the Bible says in verse 30, by faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. By faith, notice, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. Notice what it says. By faith The harlot Rahab perished not. She was saved, listen to me, she was saved by faith. She wasn't saved by being baptized, joining the church, speaking in tongues, turning over a new leaf. And here's the amazing thing about Rahab. She makes it in to Hebrews chapter 11, God's faith chapter. God's hall of faith. Think about this. As far as I can tell, there's only two women mentioned here, Sarah and Rahab. I mean, here's this woman, the harlot, a Canaanite, a Gentile, and God spares her. And the next thing we know, she's commemorated, she's commended for her faith. She believed in the living God. Think about it. Hannah didn't make it. Deborah didn't make it. Esther didn't make it. Rachel didn't make it. Rebecca didn't make it. Who's in there? Rahab the harlot. That's amazing grace. We sing the song, but do we really, really, does, do we really get it? This idea of grace. I mean, we've heard it and heard it and heard it and heard it. But do you really understand grace? You really understand, like, the only reason you're saved is because of God's grace. And we deserve nothing but hell. And yet God saves our soul. Look back with me in Joshua chapter 2. I hope you held your place. And in Joshua chapter number 2 and verse 18, Behold, when we came into the land, when we come into the land, thou shalt bind this line of scarlet thread in the window which thou did let us down by. And thou shalt bring thy father and thy mother and thy brother and all thy father's household home unto thee. And verse 21, and she said, according unto your work, so be it, your word, so be it. And she sent them away and they departed and she bound the scarlet line in the window. The scarlet line in the window. She was saved, but let me make you this statement. She was saved because of the scarlet thread. She was saved because of the scarlet thread. We are all saved because of the scarlet thread. I'm not talking about that cord of material, but I'm talking about the scarlet thread that runs through this Word of God. There's a scarlet thread in this book, and God initiates it. Over in Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve, they make aprons, and God won't accept their own works. He won't accept their fig leaf religion, and God makes them coats of skins. And when he makes those coats of skins, we see the idea of substitution the innocent dying for the guilty, but we also see the idea that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. I believe just like that scarlet thread, that we have this scarlet thread, and nobody's saved, listen, without the blood of Jesus Christ. 
It's the blood of Jesus Christ that saves our souls. Noah, when he came out of the flood, he took two of every animal in the ark, but the clean animals went in by seven. There were three couples there, and then there was an extra one of the clean animals. And when Noah come out of that ark, he built an altar, and he sacrificed that clean animal to God. And that animal's blood was shed. We see Abraham. Abraham was known as an altar builder. Abraham, everywhere he went, he built altars, except one place. He took a little side trip down to Egypt, which is a picture of the world. And when he was down there in Egypt, he didn't build any altar. He also picked up a friend down there named Hagar, and she was an Egyptian, and that started the whole mess that we've got going on over in the Middle East right now. Moses, with the Levitical priesthood, all, listen, all those animals, all those lambs, all these, these sacrifices, they were all just a shadow. They were all just a type. But all through that period under the law, all through that Old Testament time, there was just sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice, and that line keeps going right through there. How about down in Egypt? They get down in Egypt land, they're down there over 400 years, and God sees their suffering, and God brings those plagues on Egypt. And finally, that last plague, the firstborn in every house is going to be killed. And God tells Moses, he says, Moses, take a lamb. Take a perfect lamb, a lamb without blemish, a lamb without spot. And that lamb has to die. That lamb's going to die. And when you take that lamb, you kill that lamb, you take the blood. And he didn't say, when I see the dead lamb, I'll pass over you. But he said, when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. And just like uh, Rahab had that scarlet thread, those Jewish people had that blood on the doorpost on the lentil. And when God saw that blood, he passed over. In Luke chapter 23, and we've just got through our Resurrection Sunday, the Bible says, and they came to the place which is called Calvary. And there they crucified him. And the male factors, one on the right hand and one on the left. And at Calvary, listen, all those types, all those shadows, all those animals, all those figures, that scarlet thread, all that was perfected. It came into being at Calvary. Because now we see the sinless blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn with me over to 1 Peter, chapter number 1. Please turn with me. All those types, everything was fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. By, Paul said those things, those holy days, all, the, all, the, every, all those types, all, I, they're all just a shadow. They're all just a picture of the Lord Jesus. In him, it's all fulfilled. All the law and all the prophets are fulfilled in him. Verse 18, 1 Peter 1, 18, for as much as you know, you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. You remember Abraham? I preached on this last week. Isaac says, here's the wood, here's the fire. Where's the lamb? And God says, Abraham says, my son, God will provide himself a lamb. He will provide himself a lamb. Over in Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out on the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now has come salvation and strength 
and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And notice, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. That scarlet thread begins in Genesis, comes on through Exodus, comes on through the Bible, comes on through Luke, the Gospels, and right on into the book of Revelation. The scarlet thread. She wouldn't have been saved without that thread. She's saved by faith, but that thread had to be hanging there. And we're saved by faith, but it's the blood of Jesus Christ that pays for our sins. I want you to look at something with me, Matthew chapter number one. Please turn. This is too good. I don't want you to miss it. We're talking about grace. We're talking about how great God is and how great God's grace is and how God can save anybody and how there's no sin too great for, for God. But I want you to look at something amazing. One amazing thing about Rahab is she's in Hebrews chapter 11. Listed there with Abraham and listed there with Noah and listed there with Moses. And now in Matthew chapter number one, we have Joseph's genealogy. It says, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David. You remember blind Bartimaeus? Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. That's one of the titles for Jesus. Abraham begat Isaac. And Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judas and his brethren, and Judas begat Phares and Zara of Tamar, and Phares begat Ezram, and Ezram begat Aram, and Aram begat Aminadab, and Aminadab begat Naasan, and Naasan begat Salmon, and Salmon begat Boaz of Rahab. And Boaz begat Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David the king. In this genealogy, we have Christ's ancestry. And it amazes me that we have Ruth the Moabitess in there. But what really amazes me is right in the middle of this genealogy, we have Rahab. That, that, just, that just blows my mind. The great, great grandmother of King David, the man after God's own heart, Rahab the harlot. In the line of Jesus, the legal father of Joseph, not his real father, Rahab the harlot. You talk about a picture of grace. What is she doing in there? What in the world is she doing in there? Well, let me just say this. When you get to heaven, somebody's going to say, what are they doing here? How in the world did they get here? Well, it was faith and the scarlet thread. 